So greetings and welcome to both our in-person and online attendees. We are indeed very fortunate to have such esteemed guests as our panelists this afternoon. And I'm looking forward to what will no doubt be an exciting and insightful dialogue on some of the most intractable challenges facing international security through the lens of a regular warfare. I would first like to take just a brief moment to introduce myself and fellow panelists for this event. My name is Erin McPhee, and I am the Principal Investigator for the Trust After Betrayal Project, based out of London School of Economics and Political Science and housed in the Latin America and Caribbean Center. Trust After Betrayal explores interpersonal trust building between formerly armed actors and families, communities, and institutions who receive them in the wake of war and other forms of organized violence. The mission of the projects is to lead programs and policies across the academic, practitioner, and policymaker sectors to facilitate the sustainable integration of these actors and to contribute to resilience building, reducing vulnerabilities, and improving conditions of human security for violence-affected individuals and societies. Our host for the evening, the Empirical Studies of Conflict Project here at Princeton, supports research on insurgency, civil war, and other politically motivated violence worldwide. Today, ESOC identifies and compiles a wide range of micro-level data to empower scholarship and to help address pressing security threats. Beyond supporting research, ESOC is committed to enabling policy responses to challenges related to political violence, ranging from civil war to economic development, to misinformation campaigns. ESOC has four objectives. Collect, sanitize, aggregate, and modify data for research. Provide data to scholars and policy analysts. Use experts to conduct studies and analyses and maintain relationships between scholars and practitioners. In particular, I would like to thank Nancy Huff and Kristen DeCares and Professor Jacob Shapiro for their masterful efforts behind the scenes. Finally, the Irregular Warfare Initiative has been the driving energy behind foregrounding the framing of the topic of today's discussion. I am delighted and honored to also serve as a Deputy Director of the Fellows Program for this robust network of leaders and thought, in thought and practice. The Irregular Warfare Initiative continually delivers relevant discussions to the IW community and beyond to study and adapt to an evolving security environment. Its mission is to bridge the gap between scholars, practitioners, and policymakers through events such as this one, and also through its podcast, editorial content, and non-resident fellows programs. IWI represents a team of over 50 volunteers from many different professional backgrounds who are passionate about the future of regular warfare and putting research and solutions into the field. Much thanks is also due to Guido Torres, Ami Dominguez, Jack Curtin and Nolan Musselwhite, and the entire IWI communications team for their tireless work leading up to today. A brief logistical note, we've received cards here, so given the hybrid nature of this event and the large number of people attending online, we will be receiving questions from the audience present in the room in written format, and I will try to combine questions thematically for our guests so that as many people as possible have the opportunity to have their questions addressed. Please feel free to jot them down and signal to our team at any time, and I will facilitate the conversation among our guests for the first hour, and then we'll move to the Q&A portion following that. So now for the real reason that we're here, uh, our esteemed panelists. Their extended bios are up at the entrance, and I encourage you to read them. Uh, I apologize in advance for the violence that I will do in the them so much right now. Mm -hmm. um, so at the end, we have the Honorable Mary Beth Long, who served as the first woman confirmed by the U.S. Senate as an Assistant Secretary of Defense and served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, leading international security affairs. She also was the first female chair of NATO's senior most nuclear and missile defense body, the High Level Group, reporting directly to NATO's Secretary General. While at Defense, Ms. Long also served as a senior defense representative to the Deputies Committee at the National Security Council for the areas within her responsibility and held a number of other senior positions. To those credentials, she adds more than a decade of Central Intelligence Agency operational experience on terrorism, covert action, counterproliferation, and other security issues. 
Ms. Long has a distinguished track record in both the public and private sectors through decades of experience in national security policy and defense strategy. She has founded two multi-million dollar advisory firms that have helped several Fortune 500 companies close over $2 billion in international orders. Ms. Long has received the Department of Defense's highest civilian awards, including the Medal for Distinguished Public Service, the Chairman and Joint Chiefs of Staff Distinguished Civilian Service Award, the National Guard Patriot Award, and CIA Superior and Exceptional Performance Awards. To her right is Mr. Doug Livermore, who serves as the Director of Special Operations, Irregular Warfare, Special Programs, and Sensitive Activities, and as a Senior Intelligence Officer in the Office of the Deputy Undersecretary of the Navy. Prior to joining the Department of the Navy, Mr. Livermore served as a Contracted Sensitive Activities Advisor to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, and previously covered a similar portfolio advising the Undersecretary for Defense, Intelligence, and Security in the Sensitive Special Operations Division. Among his many volunteer endeavors, Mr. Livermore serves on the Board of Directors for the Special Forces Operation Association, No One Left Behind, and the Special Operations Association of America. During his military career, he served seven tours of duty between Iraq, Afghanistan, Mali, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Central African Republic, with 10th Mountain Division, 10th Special Forces Group, and other special operations organizations. He recently returned from a third deployment to Iraq, this time serving as a Deputy Commander of Special Operations Advisory Group, Iraq, advising the Iraqi Counterterrorism Service and Federal Intelligence and Investigations Agency at the ministerial level. Mr. Livermore earned the Combat Infantry Badge, Combat Action Badge, Meritorious Service Medal, Bronze Star Medal, Military Outstanding Volunteer Service Medal, four Army Commendation Medals, and one was an award for valor. Mr. James Sines is currently serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Counter Narcotics and Stabilization Policy. Mr. Sines provides policy advice to senior DOD officials, coordinates interagency efforts to counter illicit activity, and oversees all DOD activities concerning counter illicit drug trafficking, counter transnational organized crime, counter threat finance, stability operations, peacekeeping missions, and civil affairs. Previously, Mr. Sines served 30 years as a U.S. Army officer, most of the time in Special Forces. Green Berets, where he completed a variety of assignments throughout the world and commanded at all levels from detachment to brigade. Notably, he commanded two separate Special Forces detachments, or A-teams, the full accounting mission in Vietnam, and the Army's <coughs> largest overseas garrison located in Germany. His operational and combat experience includes Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm, numerous counter-narcotics missions in South and Central America, several disaster relief, relief efforts in Central America, Operation Enduring Freedom, and multiple global war on terrorism activities at home and abroad. Now let us begin our conversation, which is grounded in the premise that it is critical to think about different kinds of non-state armed actors through the analytic lens of irregular warfare. And we are not alone in this thinking. Indeed, in a bit of serendipity, an article recently published by the same name as this panel by Mark Baradovic highlighted the importance of increasing our analytic attention in this area. I am certainly happy to be so bold as to claim great minds in that regard and delight in a shared thought partner in this space. By irregular warfare, we are referring to the use of non-traditional tactics and strategies by non-state armed actors to achieve their objectives. There may be some debate about that definition today on this panel. This can include <coughs> terrorism, insurgency, and other forms of asymmetric warfare. By analyzing non-state armed actors through this lens, we are arguing that analysts and policymakers can better understand the ways in which these groups operate, the challenges they pose to state security forces, and the potential strategies that can be used to counter their activities. Irregular warfare is characterized by its complexity, adaptability, asymmetry, which means that traditional military tactics may not be effective in dealing with these kinds of actors. Furthermore, the use of irregular warfare tactics by the armed actors has become increasingly common in contemporary conflicts, and understanding this phenomenon is crucial for policymakers and analysts 
working to promote peace and stability in conflict affected regions. So thank you again all for joining us today. And I'll hand it over to Mr. James Sines to provide some opening comments. Well, thank you very much. And first off, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. McHugh. Thank you, Princeton, for having us here today. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here. I look forward to our conversations. I am sure I will learn uh, more than anyone else, especially listening to my colleagues here uh, on the panel. Uh, and so uh, you, you heard my, my biography uh, and, and where I currently work. And just to recap very quickly, the activities which I'm responsible for, counter narcotics, counter international organized crime, counter finance, stability, peacekeeping, uh, and civil affairs, those are all components of how the Department of Defense currently defines regular warfare when we, in the United States, uh, participate in regular, regular warfare. Uh, my office is part of the uh, Special Operations Multi-Tensity Conflict Office under uh, the uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, and so that's where we all meet together to speak about special operations. I think at the bottom we'll talk, though, how in the past uh, irregular warfare was uh, considered synonymous with special operations, and that is no longer the case for the Department of Defense. Uh, we believe that there are activities within special uh, within uh, irregular warfare that ought to be uh, completed and, and participate on with all parts of our military, uh, to include the conventional uh, side. And so we've been working very hard in the Department of Defense to one define irregular warfare, and we're in the process of finalizing the next definition. Uh, I will tell you that we go through this process probably every couple of years of defining what irregular warfare means. Um, but by and large, those activities, at least underneath the regular warfare, tend to be pretty consistent over time. Um, and so I think that's where we can find some commonality when we start talking about uh, irregular warfare. Certainly, we have been looking quite uh, a bit at irregular warfare and how that connects with my portfolio. So if you want to talk about current narcotics and time trends like going organized crime, but also when we talk about stability operations. And how all those efforts can assist us in our national defense strategy. And I look forward to talking a little bit later about how our, our current strategy connects with regular warfare and integrated terms of the global level conflict. Uh, hey, thanks, Dr. McPhee. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. It's kind of I'll uh, segue off of what Dad Saint was discussing. Uh, as a, in my current role as the Director of Special Operations and Irregular Warfare, amongst other things for the Department of Navy, I primarily look at irregular warfare from a force providing perspective. Uh, the Department of the Navy, where I work, provides forces, resources, personnel to support the combatant commands and their requirements. Uh, as we look at the future of what those requirements will become, what they are currently, uh, we seek to shape the force through acquisitions, through manpower and training. Uh, one of the challenges, having looked at irregular warfare for a number of years, both as a practitioner, uh, as in my military career, but now also at the Pentagon in the policymaking space, is how do we bring the total force into this discussion in a way that extends the irregular warfare domain beyond the traditional special operations environment? And, and this is certainly a challenge as we look to the post-global war on terror era, as we move back into this era of great power competition. Uh, one of the challenges that we see is in many cases, when we talk about our competitors on the, on the global stage, people in the Republic of China, the Russian Federation, they don't necessarily spend as much time as we do agonizing over the definition of the regular warfare, what is regular warfare, what's not irregular warfare. Uh, and, and that is certainly something that, to the greatest extent possible, I view as a representative of the force provider of the Department of the Navy. How do we minimize those concerns for the operators downrange that are going to be actually conducting the activities and, and putting U.S. policy into a, into effect? On I, I use the term battlefield loosely because to to the previous comments, uh, it doesn't really look tr like a traditional battlefield that our forces are used to. Uh, as, I, as we all know, we've been coming out of the global war on terror, where for better or for worse, and I, I think we're going to speak about this a little bit more, uh, the focus was incredibly kinetic, uh, direct action by U.S. personnel to the extent possible, uh, supporting and working by, with, and through our partners and allies. But it was, at the end of the day, the battlefield.
field effects were incredibly kinetic. As we move into the irregular warfare domain and how we reconfigure the force, re-educate the force to meet those challenges, it doesn't look like a battlefield. As many of these activities occur below the, the threshold of what we consider traditional warfare, we take we, we take into account what those operators will have to look like as they're operating asymmetrically, clandestinely, sometimes covertly, to get after these problems in an asymmetric fashion. Uh, so again, I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. I think that given the vast experience my left and right, I too am looking forward to learning an awful lot. And again, just appreciate, I appreciate the opportunity. Dr. McPhee, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. And thank all of you who are online here for showing up. I was a professor. I taught a late class. Thank you for being here. I have <laughs> a lot of good options. So, let's see. Um, I'm going to start out at CIA as a covert operator, um, recruiting counter narcotics, which one of my things, counter proliferation. I then shared a DEA CIA task force against counter narcotics and narco terrorism. Um, and then actually ran Western Hemisphere and and blah blah blah, and then had the best job in the universe, which is the job that Daz D Science has now. And it, it, it was it was the best job. Now it's the most impossible job because they've blown out what uh, that office does to it basically include everything that is in Connecticut. And God bless you for taking on that job and good luck. And these guys, both of them. Mm -hmm. Know much more about this, much more current than I am. I'm an old lady. Um, take everything I say with a grain of salt, but I do have a strong opinion. And I, I worry a little bit that as soon as we start talking about forces and doctrine and preparing our troops, and these guys are special operators and devolving irregular warfare down to the warfighter, we've lost the war, the irregular war. We'll win the battles because these guys are by far the best in the world. Um, but the problem with irregular warfare is it's irregular. And it, I believe, is the most dominant type of warfare, first, definitely in the 21st century, but it's going to be first and foremost in the next century. Um, our adversaries, including our peer to peer adversaries, are already doubled down on irregular warfare. So, what does that mean? And without getting into this naval gazing, that we do every four years when we do the quadrennial defense review and all of that. And these guys are right. We, we tinker around the edges. But, the, you know, at, at the baseline, the irregular war, warfare is gray zone warfare. It's warfare before the Kinect Park starts. And then it doesn't stop after that. Generally, they're usually going in parallel. Um, you could say traditionally phase zero warfare to try to prevent the war before people actually have to deploy conventional troops. That's probably a previous definition of a regular warfare. But if you use that definition, we are way behind the curve in first and foremost, peer-to-peer -peer competition. China has been kicking our butts on irregular warfare and continues to do so. And we don't get smart about it and get it not just in the Department of Defense, but in the rest of our security strategy, our national security strategy, we're, we're going to continue to lose the war. And that means things like what Dr. McPhee is talking about is how do you prevent people from signing up in the first place? How do you take somebody who's involved in regular warfare and address their motivations so they leave it? And you can't do that by little green men on the battlefield once it gets down to the special operators. So it really has to be, we used to call it pool of government. I, I like the idea someone brought it up, you know, total defense, but it's got to be employing all the tools that the irregular warfare malignant actors are using against us. And you can't do that just from DOD. So what is that? What does that look like? That's economic tools. That's where China is really way ahead of us. It's narratives and propaganda and, and basically forming the battle space with what the facts are. We can't rely on the Army's uh, influence operations or whatever we want to call the psychological operations this year. You can't rely on that. That is a whole of government. That is a whole of nation effort. And that's another place. China gets up every week and talks about the South, uh, the islands and you know, Southeast Asian seas, etc., and shows you maps and shows you how traditionally this was Chinese territory that's been 
unfairly taken from them and they're just going home, yada, 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 yada. No, and that's sort of lawfare where you're defining, you're using the law to basically set this narrative, narrative which is false. The history is false, but we don't even combat that. So there's lawfare, there's propaganda, there's cyber warfare. Our military isn't going to be the primary actor on the regular warfare conducted through cyber. There's space. There's um, all kinds of criminal activities and use of proxies, uh, whether they are formal proxies like the Wagner Group, which is this quasi-governmental commercial entity that is out there fighting either on the behalf of Russia and the Ukraine or sort of as an independent actor in Libya and Africa, so to speak. Uh, so your actors have changed. Your weapons have changed. The weapons available to non-state actors now have a global, massive casualty reach. So we can't pretend that the irregular warfare that we dealt with 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, criminal organizations with guns and bullets, maybe bombs, maybe beheadings, is the same kind of policies and procedures that we're going to rely on our military to fight irregular warfare now. It doesn't suffice. Uh, the attack on uh, logistics change, great piece of irregular warfare that's being conducted out there. What we're going to depend on the Department of Defense to stop that. So we've got to redefine them from a national perspective. What is irregular warfare? We've got to break it down and figure out what are the components. Then we've got to figure out how we're going to address it as a nation, a component of which will be the Department of Defense. And then within the Department of Defense, we've got to assign it to every unit and every organization as part of their doctrine, as part of a national effort. And then we've got to figure out what our objectives are. Are we going to combat every story the Chinese come up with? Are we going to combat every economic sanction and unfair practice that we know is part of a Chinese strategy? Are we going to combat China infiltrating our universities and framing doctrines and attacking Taiwanese students on campus as part of their political malign activities? Is that part of influencing operations as part of the regular warfare? So that's where I sort of look at it with a much a little bit more open aperture, a little more strategic, but trying to drill on the big picture before we address the little picture of what is an irregular operation and irregular warfare. Um, so, as you can see, we have truly an embarrassment of riches in terms of experience uh, at the table today. So, I think we're also seeing that there's sort of some flex and fuzziness around the edges of the defining of this category and what maybe is and is not included in the scope, depending on your positionality of how you're viewing it. So, I'm hoping to take advantage of that fuzziness and see how thinking through the lens of a regular warfare in areas that are traditionally not regarded in this way might be productive. Um, so I think I'll pose uh, to the panel, maybe in the same order that works for you, the question of what can we potentially gain by thinking about things like cartel violence, gang violence, um, organized transnational organized crime, and other forms of organized violence that are not typically branded as a regular warfare through this particular analytic lens. Does that make sense? Sure, thank you very much. And so actually, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, is think about criminal activities, transnational criminal organizations, and how we as the Department of Defense support our law enforcement partners in getting after these organizations. So I think what's significant to understand the role of work that we do in supporting law enforcement is that you know, we're not looking at the, at the street crime, right? I mean, that's not our place to work, right? But we look at large, mostly uh, drug cartel organizations that are truly global networks and have global influence and are conducting operations around the world. And so how do we get after that network? How do we help our law enforcement partners who have the authority to actually uh, prosecute, arrest, uh, sanction these organizations? Understand that larger picture. I think what we do quite a bit is draw from what we learned during, during uh, our counterterrorism activities. We learned to it takes a network to defeat a network, and we learned how to map the terrorist networks, identify their weak points, and then go after those, those weak points. One of the things we've learned in our counter drug efforts is that we're not going to just interdict our way out of it. We can try.
trying that for 40 years, and we've not gotten anywhere. So just putting drugs on the table is not going to get us there. But if we can understand that network and find those, those unique linkages that can be disrupted more effectively, like their finances, which we spend a lot of time going on. Uh, like the precursor drugs that are necessary to develop uh, uh, the synthetic drugs specific technology. Um, some of the pill presses that are used to make these drugs are very hard to get out of. So these are unique capabilities that are therefore easier to attack than the overall network. And when we think about regular warfare, this is regular warfare. If we look at the, if we open up our definition of regular warfare, warfare and just say those are all those activities that we're going to do below level conflict, well, that's what we're doing every day. Uh, and to the honorable logs point, it's a whole government solution, right? So we have law enforcement involved, we have partner nations involved, we have the State Department involved. So it truly is an international and interagency attempt to get out to this problem set. I think that's something we can learn when we're, when we're looking at, at pushing back against our uh, competitors worldwide, is leveraging the whole of government. One of the things I also like to point out is when we talk about these drug cartels and their global network, and we talk about how are we going to certainly get after our competitors like China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and existing biomechanics organizations. They are operating in that exact same space. In fact, they are leveraging these criminal organizations to support their malign activities. Wagner Group is mentioned. Wagner Group, where they are located around the world, taxes the movement of illicit trafficking through the area. Provides them funding to push Russia's uh, agenda. Chinese organizations are the number one uh, money launderers in the world, which provides China an opportunity to push their malign activities. And then our competitors have a manager fighting on two fronts. So they take advantage of those criminal organizations and leverage those criminal organizations to fund their activities. And then as we do, we go forward to our partner nations say, we want to help you out. Can we help you out because you're having some troubles here? But I think we truly mean it. Our competitors do the same thing, but they're just trying to get a full hold on the ground there in order to build a base that they get to use, build an airfield they get to use, strip away the natural resources that the Tiger Group is doing in Africa uh, so they can play both sides of the equation. Uh, and I'll think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I. Uh, I hate to bring it back to definitions, but to, to the honorable's <laughs> point, that, that is something that we do a lot of building. That just stop calling me the honorable. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I should be like, here comes the judge. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the current Department of Defense definition of regular warfare does talk about a violent struggle among state and non-state actors for legitimacy and influence amongst the relevant uh, uh, populations. Now, of course, as currently we are actively in review, and to my colleagues back at the Pentagon who have gotten tired of me talking about my thoughts on the definition, I apologize. Um, but all that to say, regardless of where the definition lands, and recognizing that the U.S. Department of Defense's definition is not the definitive uh, final answer on how the rest of the world defines a regular warfare. I do agree that at the end of the day, uh, this is a form of warfare that oftentimes involves non-state groups, such as uh, uh, criminal organizations that are vying for some form of influence and legitimacy, oftentimes in places of the world where there is either a lack of governance uh, that they are seeking to fill, or weak governance where they're looking to supplant and assert themselves. Um, so just from a definitional perspective, I think that something that we have traditionally in the Department of Defense failed to do is look at the impact that uh, non-state organizations like transnational criminal organizations play in that space. Um, to build off of Dazzy's previous point, uh, at the end of the day, many of these transnational criminal organizations are primarily motivated by money. They seek financial gain, and that makes them incredibly useful and vulnerable and Ready, readily used as surrogates for our adversaries, be it the Chinese, the Russians, any of the Iranians, any number of countries around the world. 
Um, now, the, that level of control that uh, our adversaries exert over these transnational criminal organizations tends to vary. I think the, there was a perfect example where there are parallel objectives, such as with the narcotic smuggling, uh, with the cartels through Latin America, Mexico, into the United States. The cartels gain money, uh, which is certainly something that they're seeking. Uh, for instance, the, the failure on the part of like the, the People's Republic of China to stop the flow of fentanyl from their end into the beginning of those smuggling networks also serves a secondary advantage of their flight in the United States with fentanyl and any number of other precursor drugs that contribute to that in a way that has the, the two-pronged or the, the, the two-fronted advantage of both weakening the United States internally while also gaining the funding that then they, they employ uh, into uh, their, their follow-on operations. Um, I, I think a challenge from a policy perspective when we look at this is that incredibly thin line between a transnational criminal organization and a pure spirit or a rebel group or a terrorist organization. History is replete with examples of organizations that have been on, started on one side of the line, crossed over to the other side, and oftentimes flip flop, flop back and forth. Uh, the one example that I was specifically going to mention, the uh, ELN, the Ejército de Liberación Nacional, from the, it's a Colombian rebel group, got its start in the 1960s as a Marxist Leninist group throughout its history. It was supported by the Cubans, the Soviets, a number of other communist countries. Following the fall of the Soviet Union, they found themselves getting into uh, illegal mining, narcotics, we basically became a narco uh, terrorist organization. But now there's plenty of indications that as they find safe haven in Venezuela, uh, they've become in many ways a surrogate that is employed to a greater or lesser extent by uh, Venezuelans, um, who we find at different times on the opposite side of, of the United States and our partners and allies. So th that would be an example of the challenge in how do you define a transnational criminal organization within the context of how they fit into the regular warfare domain. Um, and then I guess I'll just stop by with this one last thought that how I view this is by failing to view transnational criminal organizations as very real non-state actors in the irregular warfare domain, we are creating both a, a strategic and a policy blind spot that is being to the points that have already been made, uh, a blind spot that allows our adversaries to operate in a space where we may not be optimally responding. I'm going to take that and say that's, if you walk away with anything, um, what Doug just said is, is a really important takeaway. And what DAS Design said, um, I'm going to just repeat in a slightly different manner. Um, the second thing I would want you to take away is pivots off of what James and Doug said, but I'm going to put it in slightly different verbiage. And the, the first, first is what he says this blind spot, our failure to not look at proxy groups and ill-defined organizations as strategic security threats um, is really a problem and it's going to continue to be a problem. And the second point I'm going to make is, um, and part of that is because we are Western, we're Western trained, we think as Westerners, and the world is not set up the way we're organized and the way we think. We tend to think, oh, you're a terrorist or you're narco traffickers. You know, sometimes you're on this side of the fence, sometimes you're on that side of the fence. Uh, your, your coincidence of interest with another organization may ebb and flow. But in our deep little hearts, we think you belong one side or the other. The world doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. And these guys as special operators actually know that more than anyone. But it's just not organized um, the way we want it to be organized. Perfect example. I sat in the meeting of the ministers of defense of all of the Latin American countries in 2006 or 2008, and they begged the United States government to address the fact that they had a substantial number of people that we were shipping home. These were illegal immigrants who we kept in our prisons. Um, and, and after their prison service was done, or we would send them home to that we repatriate them to become part of their society. And that was a DOJ, whatever dysfunction. And what they were coming and telling us is saying, hey, these guys were bad actors when they arrived on your soil. What you're returning are organized, well-trained, and these people are professional criminals. And it isn't just a gang problem. You're, 
M M13, all these, I guess 13, sorry, all these really bad, bad, these guys are serious, like lethal operatives, and it's going to be a national security threat. And we said, no, it isn't. These are just, you don't deal with it. Law enforcement, you have some gang activities, yada, yada. 20 years later, and these are the primary actors of some of the national security issues in Honduras, Nicaragua, Salvador, Guatemala, that are driving the instability that is driving illegal immigration and that is causing huge problems, not only in narco trafficking, but just about every illegal activity. And some of that, frankly, they warned us about almost 20 years ago. And we did nothing because that's DOJ, that's DEA, that's whatever. And that's sort of the way we approach all of this. So the, the point of what are we going to learn from our experience is number one, the players aren't in little categories and they're never going to be. And we need to figure out how to deal with that. Another perfect example, Afghanistan. We can't deal with narcotics. It's not part of DOD's portfolio. We've got Camp Columbia, no link between narcotics and the Taliban. Guess who was it? I had to shove it down the special forces' throats that every time you found a cache of weapons, you also found, guess what? Opium. Guess why? The Taliban was not digging guns out of the ground. They were 40 years old. They were buying new ones. With what? Opium money. Oh, we better talk about, we better talk to DEA and get them out there. What are they going to do? Drop a bunch of DEA guys in the middle of Kandahar? <laughs> we think everything is all lined up and we organize ourselves this way. It don't work that way. So players and processes and tools, we've got to be more flexible. Thank you, Thank you all of you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's been spectacular hearing a little bit about how this irregular warfare, I think blind spot is a great way of thinking about it and how we might sort of you know, disentangle or untangle, if I can refer to the panel topic, um, untangle the Gordian knot a little bit by being more capacious in the way we think about transnational organized crime and cartels uh, and the way that it moves and actually flows in reality versus in institutional silos and sort of hamstrung bureaucracies. Um, so I want to sort of turn it in the other direction now and say, were we to do that, what could we actually learn about irregular warfare if we do integrate, you know, as a concept, as a domain of policy, as an area of practice, if we do actually take that step and really integrate these other forms of groups of organized violence into our thinking about irregular warfare, how might that improve our work in that area or policy making? I can start again? All right, wonderful. Well, I mean, I think we've got a system. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll build off of what Mary Beth was saying. <laughs> and, and so I think um, I think there's a bit of good news in that uh, we as, as the federal government of the United States are beginning to realize uh, after a long time uh, that most of the challenges in this world uh, have to be over government interagency solutions. Beyond that, we have to make sure that we're leveraging our allies and partners around the globe as well. And so um, we still have up challenges being siloed. Uh, I think it's not from not understanding the problem and not understanding uh, the fact that these criminal organizations don't operate in the same rules that we do. If I don't be criminal. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that uh, our competitors are uh, take full advantage of their criminality to support their uh, malign activities. What I think it comes down to, though, is just two challenges that we need to that we need to work through in order to be able to be flexible and responsive. So one is uh, while we may have a more clear mindset of how we have to operate together, we are all still constrained by the authorities in which we are funded by Congress. And so then there's two parts there that we need to look at. We need to look at either presenting a good argument to Congress about why those authorities should be adjusted or changed, right? Or we more immediately can just make sure we work with our partners across the different agencies and across the different departments to understand here are my authorities and its limitations. What are your authorities and your limitations? And then where can we find those across in order to bring to get to bear your law enforcement capabilities and examples? My Intelligence activities as the Department of Defense, and where can we find some synergy 
And that's what I think we're trying to, to, to work on uh, right now. Um, and then the second challenge is really the cultures. We can agree intellectually that we need to work closer together as an agency. We agree intellectually that we need to work more closely with uh, partners around, around the world. But if you're part of a very large in, in, uh, organization, um, it's very hard to change that organization's organizational personality and to stop thinking automatically, almost subconsciously, in terms of protecting your style. Uh, I think we realize that, and I think the understand this could take a while to, to, to break through that. But I think once we start doing that, I think we get to what, you're, what you were talking about and truly understanding this uh, network of threats that operate uh, in the irregular warfare space, that operate below the level of conflict. And then to bring solutions that also look beyond our traditional mindsets to get out of these sort of challenges. I think Dusty slides nailed it. Um, I'll add one small caveat. I am much less optimistic than he is because we did this was the discovery of the Afghan war, this was the discovery of the Iraq war, the whole of government. You know, I, I, I hate saying whole of government anymore because it's become so meaningless. He's exactly right, it end, but it does end up at institutions and stove piping. And let's be honest, it ends up with power plays and money plays. And the only way you're going to defeat those institutions is leadership. And we don't have it a lot of the time. And that's the only thing that can drive exactly what he's talking about beyond the this is my silo and gosh darn it, stay out of it. I, I do think the current national security strategy, I think it mentions irregular warfare. Maybe once. And it's my understanding, and I'm happy to be corrected, that we have pushed irregular warfare down to the service of operational and, and disciplinary uh, doctrine level. Uh, that's a failure of leadership, and, and that's something that we'll have to you know, work on. But frankly, I think you nailed it. And I will just push back lightly as, as a rep for a service secretariat um, <laughs> at the Department of Navy. I, I agree that. The regular warfare guidance has not been pushed down to the lowest levels through the services and to the combat commands just yet. But to, to the previous point, I, I like to think of the Department of Defense as an aircraft carrier. It does not turn quickly. Um, whereas the previous, the 2018 National Defense Strategy had a separate uh, annex for regular warfare. The 2022 NDS does have the concepts through total, uh, total defense and some other irregular warfare concepts more baked into it. Uh, within the building in the Pentagon, we are working through the process to do irregular warfare implementation guidance. Uh, one of my tasks at the Department of the Navy is to then translate that into a Secretary of the Navy's irregular warfare implementation guidance. So we, we are starting to push down, and that will look like uh, sort of like I started with education and doctrinal change in the Department of the Navy. The other services will go through a similar process, uh, really look at the organization and manning of the force to I, to be responsive to what we see as those emerging requirements for irregular warfare. And really, uh, something that we were talking about before the panel, how do we incorporate the rest of the conventional side, the non-special operations side of the House, into the irregular warfare discussion so they understand that their regular engagements with partners and, and allies all around the world directly contribute to irregular warfare in the sense that it, emboldens them, it bolsters them, it, it, it builds up their capabilities and their better partners and allies for us, while undermining some of these narratives, these malign activities that we see from, from our adversaries. Um, I, going back to the specific question, I think that as we look at irregular warfare as a struggle for legitimacy, legitimacy and influence over relevant populations, for the Department of Defense, I, I think that where we struggle <coughs> less so in the special operations community, is how we view transnational organized criminal organizations as a viable target within that space. Um, to, to the DASD's previous point, I think that most folks in the Department of Defense look at transnational criminal organizations as a purely law enforcement problem, something that oftentimes, I hate to say this, it looks like traditional law enforcement, you know, law enforcement intelligence activity, and somewhat below the level of where most combatant commanders see the immediate threat, the things that they have required to use, which they will request forces or services like the Department of the Navy to provide. Um, yeah. I think that kind of going 
going back to our previous question where we were talking about recognizing the importance of these organizations and the outside impact that they have in supporting our adversaries' irregular warfare efforts, uh, we are collectively in the Department of Defense coming around to seeing that threat in a way that allows us to better align resources against those problem sets. Um, from a policy and, a, and some of the challenges that I think we face, particularly as we talk about the Department of Defense partnering with, advising, equipping, working alongside, by, with, and through uh, host nation forces. In many cases, the Department of Defense is not a primary partner for a lot of the local law enforcement. And then that gets into working with these partner nations in a way that I think we haven't necessarily had to do with the global war on terror in Afghanistan and Iraq, where there was very much a, a, a senior partner and a junior partner scenario where Though we were enabling and working by with and through, we got to largely set the conditions of the engagement. And uh, and I think that particularly as we start looking at our partners in, in the fight against transnational criminal organizations, that requires a recalibration of how we approach the problem and how we interact in a way that, again, it's, it's been progress, but I, I can at least speak to some of what I've seen from my experience with this a little bit of a challenge. And then the last thing I will say is, particularly as a service provider, is we look forward towards how we can help in operations against transnational criminal organizations as they relate to regular warfare, is looking how we balance combatant command requirements that are more traditional war fighting in a way to basically do activities against, collection against, operations against transnational criminal organizations in parallel to and basically overlapping with those that limited support that we're all, already providing to the combatant commanders. Yeah, if I can just, uh, that's very good. Uh, let me just tag on to that a little bit. I, I, I think um, uh, to be a little more optimistic as well, uh, uh, again, so I think our combatant commanders out there uh, and, and the combatant commands do get it, and they do see the connection of uh, trans or organized crime. They do see the connect, connection to our competitors. They do see the connection to instability uh, within their regions and, and next to our uh, allies and partners. Um, but then it becomes uh, a question of resourcing and priorities. Um, some may very effectively argue that the Department of Defense budget is, is too large. Um, but at the end of the day, it still ends up, it is still a finite number, right? And there's still certain, only so much you can do with that. So we end up putting a lot of our commanders' position to deciding, I only have so many, I'm just making up an example of, of ISR assets, right? So am I going to put them towards watching um, the ships and the airplanes of China and Russia, or am I going to put them towards trying to track some kind of criminal organizations um, that are moving in illicit drugs and other illicit materials uh, through my area of operation. And so it ends up being a, a, an idea of, prior, uh, of prioritization. I do think one place we can really help are the rest of our partners, like law enforcement and the state and others, is that we don't, it doesn't have to be us doing something independently. But we can leverage our significant assets, especially when it comes to transportation, to help move their people and their material from one part of the globe to another part of the globe for them to be effective. Uh, and, and so I do think about law enforcement, and we do help law enforcement move, move globally in order for them to, to, to affect the work that they want to do. And, it, and, I, and I will say, though, it, it is a challenge. If you're if your State Department, if you're USAID, um, even if you're some of our small law enforcement uh, agencies, they, they've never been developed to have a deployable force. Right? They don't have a group of people like we do in the military waiting around to be picked up and moved to, to, to conduct an operation. Um, should they be organized that way? I don't know. But that is something that we need to identify and probably one of the reasons why the Department of Defense gets looked on, uh, looked to more often than maybe it should uh, to take on some challenges globally that are a low level conflict and maybe not uh, a place where we're a subject matter expert. Just the slightest bit of uh, an addition. I so totally agree with both of these gentlemen. And in fact, I think um, Gus's science really under 
stated. When I look at what the combatant commanders were thinking about during, um, say, the 2002 to 2012 standpoint, where you know irregular warfare and, and those great special operations, those guys got it, um, and the support to law enforcement was like of the 1,000 things I'm thinking about today, that was about 2,000. Um, and when it came to resources, you, you've got to be kidding. Wasn't that's really changed? I, I want to double down on what. Um, the DASD just said, and it's, and I think he underspoke on, if it gets to the point where the Department of Defense is trying to figure out how many resources it has and can we transport others, we've missed a really important question. And that is, are we appropriately funding and organizing the other key, key elements so that it doesn't even get to the Department of Defense and the first conversation? And those are the elements of diplomacy, the elements of USAID, and the elements of setting the narrative. The Cold War narrative, for example, the, the, the forming and strategizing about what is the story? Why are these people signing up for this in the first place? Why aren't our allies understanding what China is doing? And that's because we have vacated the battlefield pretty much, except for a couple of very small units in the Department of Defense and maybe a very small number of State Department folk who are actually involved in psychological operations, influencing operations, whatever you want to call it, but it's getting the narrative out there, setting the back streets and coming up with a national narrative, a national priority that says, it's great for USAID for you to fund XYZ PDQ, but your priorities have to be the narrative, the programs, the, the economic incentives for people not to be a bad guy, for them to plant different crops, for them to have a means of getting their produce to market, whatever that is, to keep people from being motivated in the first place, address those underlying economic concerns, address those underlying political concerns, ground zero. And we, we wait till it gets to the Department of Defense when it's really a problem without really strategizing and thinking that through first. Here, here. Um, so I'll just remind the folks in the room if you'd like to ask a question. I think everyone's been given a card, and then we can certainly start to collect them and we'll collate them together with whatever's come up online. And I'll just uh, send the last panel question around and we can open up for a little bit of the um, So we've heard about a lot of challenges and maybe what some other folks are doing right that we might want to concern ourselves with. Um, and I'd like to close with uh, building on the spirit of optimism. Uh, I'd like to see what you have to share about some of the examples that have really got here right. So what are some examples of internationally coordinated activities that have addressed some of the challenges that you raised today that you think are really either good models to go from or provide us with some important lessons to carry forward? Oh, you don't get to switch the order now. Let me <laughs> don't give me a hard time. And Columbia. Yeah, so I think you're going to talk about that. No, no, I will defer. No, I'm just okay, talking about Columbia. Thing. So I guess I'll start off by saying that, uh, uh, no, I'm not going to do that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, I don't know that we've gotten it right anywhere, but I think there's some examples um, uh, taking the right context where we've done a pretty good job. Uh, and I think uh, probably one of the model examples is the use of China Columbia. Um, and I think, and I know you have a lot to say about uh, China Columbia. So I'll, 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 I'll leave that for them first. Um, I'll just say that uh, it started with a, with a limited set of objectives, grew to a much larger set of objectives, didn't meet those first objectives, but did a great job of hitting the rest of those objectives. To the point now where Columbia is, is, a, is a firm security partner, and an exporter of security cooperation and security assistance instead of a, uh, an acceptor and importer of, 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 of such aid. From the counter narcotics, counter organized or nice crime arena, uh, we in the Department of Defense have established uh, six, seven uh, regional, what I call intelligence fusion centers around the globe. Um, and they work in support of law enforcement. And they're able to bring together um, Department of Defense assets, like ISR assets. Uh, they're able to bring together our ability to crunch big data and, and analyzing uh, information and developing an intelligence picture. 
and then support law enforcement, both U.S. law enforcement and through U.S. law enforcement, uh, partner nation law enforcement to interdict uh, drugs uh, on high seas uh, and in the air. Uh, to the point where uh, we are probably, we are, uh, again, as I talked about in the beginning, we're not going to interdict our way out of this problem, but you still need to bring that pressure on those organizations, right? And, and uh, we are probably stopping um, uh, millions of metric tons of illicit trapped goods uh, moving across the globe. But I'll let it. Guys, talk about. Please take I got another example. Okay. Um, so, Columbia, I think, started off on the right track. Um, I sounds totally self-serving because I was part of it in various, various iterations, but it lasted for decades. One of the things I think on irregular warfare, which is maybe different than more the kinetic, is that it's got to be a long-term, sustained activity, whatever, whatever you want to call it. And our, we're very patient, but it did work. Um, it was a, it was an interdiction strategy for cocaine. It started out actually with a closing down of the air routes where they're tr transporting the product, evolved into networks of networks of government agencies, law enforcement, intelligence, and the military out of Southcom in South America to address both the production, the transportation. The buying, the, the the actual cartels, so to speak, the corruption aspect with governments, um, and and all the way to the money laundering, all aspects eventually. And what it did was, I think, fairly, I think it fairly be said is it kept Colombia becoming a, a a narco state for a good twenty plus years, where the government was absolutely controlled by the cartels. Um, you know. It, we still have the farm, we still have lots of problems, but I think it was a pretty good effort. And, and frankly, these gentlemen were part of the seventh group. Uh, seventh group, the military, wore a lot of that um, on their shoulders. So. If I could just add on, and yeah, I mean, fantastic work. Thank you for the work you've done there. Uh, and it did do a couple of things that we're not very good at doing as Americans. Staying in, in, the, in the fight for the long run, right? So it's been going on for several decades. Uh, taking what could have been a failed state and now it's uh, one of our, our strongest partners and a pretty solid um, professional military, it's pretty solid uh, democratic government um, as a close neighbor. And I think one of the key points is, is that it wasn't the United States plan, right? It was the Colombians' plan. It was a plan by and for the Colombians. We were there as a key partner, but they had to come up with their own solutions, not have them opposed upon them. And I think that's one of the major keys of success. So we were all going to talk Plain Columbia. Luckily, I came up with another example that I think is also applicable. Um, and Plain Columbia is an absolutely great example of, I think, the closest we've probably come at a macro level being successful in, in these whole government efforts. Uh, but the example I was actually going to speak about uh, was from my second deployment to Iraq in 2007 when I was still a young infantry officer. Uh, I was deployed with my unit, I was in uh, 2nd Brigade 10th Mountain Division, to, uh, we were deployed to the south of Baghdad Belt. And at that time, this was really the, uh, the, the uh, place where you had the Shia majority out of the Baghdad Belt coming up against the uh, Sunni majority that were in Anbar to the, the west of Baghdad. And we saw that as like the real rift between, uh, and for those who might not have studied Iraq as closely as, as some of us up here probably did, uh, the real fundamental shift that Iraq had following the, the US-led invasion and the ouster of Saddam Hussein, whereas under Saddam Hussein, the uh, Sunni majority of the country held most of the power and oppressed the Shia minority. Well, we kind of flipped that all on its head, or let me back up. The Sunni minority of the country, of which Saddam was a member of that sect, was in charge of all the leverage of power in the country, oppressing the, the uh, Shias, and we flipped that on its head. So a lot of those tensions that have been kept down throughout Saddam Hussein's regime were laid bare. And what we saw when we deployed into the country in the South Baghdad Belt was that exasperated tenfold. Um, so, let me, so that's the conditions. Um, 
During that deployment, the United States Institute of Peace, working with a number, number of foreign partners, many of the Gulf states, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, the Saudis, uh, had actually undertaken a whole government approach to basically healing that rift between the Sunni and Shia tribes in that South Baghdad belt. So while in my role as an infantry officer in the 2nd Brigade 10th Mountain Division, we were primarily responsible for trying to set the security conditions for this plan to go into place, uh, USIP, the U.S. Institute of Peace, in conjunction with these international partners, actually attacked all the underlying issues. They first organized a number of uh, tribal sheikh meetings outside of Iraq and the UAE, uh, where they brought these sheikhs together, identified a lot of the issues that were contributing to the instability, and started to really address those through whole government. I know uh, one of the things we were talking about recently was what motivates individuals to jo join groups like this. First and foremost, economic opportunity. Uh, the South Baghdad Belt, like most of Iraq at the time, was incredibly economically depressed. There weren't a whole lot of job opportunities. There was no trade back and forth because of the rift between the, the Sunnis and the Shias. Uh, so um, the vast majority of these terrorist groups, or these insurgent groups that we were up against, were at really some mixture of nationalist or criminal organization that were using the, the, the coalition occupation as a excuse to organize, but at the end of the day, they were doing extortion against businesses, they were uh, setting up illegal checkpoints to tax trade. Um, there was primarily, think of it like mobs fighting together or, or gangs in South Central LA fighting each other over control of territory. There was actually very few of those organizations that were like the hardcore, ideologically motivated Al Qaeda and Iraq types uh, that ascribe to Wahhabist extremist ideology. So, so money was one of the things that USIP had identified as something that should be addressed for the economy. So a lot of their negotiations with these shakes were based around, okay, how do we reopen trade? How do we work through whatever bad blood historically has existed between the Sunni and the Shia tribes? And they made a lot of progress there. The other major driver of a lot of the instability in the area was the lack of security. So when the Iraqi central government under Saddam Hussein fell, there was a gigantic power vacuum. Uh, as I mentioned, the Sunnis and the Shias, who, for better or for worse, have largely been kept from open warfare, were engaged in that to a much, much greater extent. So, again, in your hierarchy of needs, security being first and foremost, a lot of these military males organize themselves into these organizations primarily, initially, to protect their, their communities from the community down the street, down the religious sect. Um, so, again, when we started talking, when USIP started talking, to these tribal shakes about how do we resolve this issue? How do we basically get folks to lay down their arms? It was There was a lot of focus on what are the security guarantees? Um, so from my perspective as an infantry officer, I'm down in the trenches. You know, the, the 10th Mountain Division is duking out with these groups each and every day, trading bullets and IEDs and all of that. Meanwhile, USIP, USIP is working in the background doing this whole government approach to find out how we uh, mend the rifts so we can get the economy going again. They got that going. How do we identify the security concerns so we can actually convince folks to lay down their arms and you know, basically go back to making money and living peacefully? Um, and, and, and this is something that I had not seen previously, and frankly, I had not seen in some of my other deployments in Afghanistan and places in Africa since, where we were actually advancing the whole of government internationally coordinated effort forward together. We're going to address the economy, we're going to address the security. We're going to address the governance issues and that set the conditions so that south baghdad belt despite a lot of violence that i experienced there during that deployment by the end of that deployment usip had uh got all the tribal shakes they came together in this town called Makhmedia, the southern baghdad belt they signed a big accord about hey we're going to bury the hatchet and we're going to move forward together and we're going to basically go back to how things were before the fall of the saddam regime um, you know, fast forward from 2007, when this occurred, to 2014, when ISIS, uh, the Islamic State in Iraq and al-Sham, comes moving through Western Bag uh, Western Iraq through al-Anbar, they only made it as far as the South Baghdad fell when they came up against this group of tribes, Sunni and Shia, that because they had gone through this process, led by USIP, internationally coordinated support, uh, were able to basically hold the line and, and, and ISIS never moved past there towards Baghdad. So that was another example of where I've seen a, a, an internationally coordinated effort lead to that sort of demobilization, the reintegration into society, and second and third order effects that actually had uh, an outsized impact on a future conflict.
Thank you all so much for your comments and questions on the other range of experiences. Um, I think I'll see if you have any questions. <coughs> So you guys buy allergies. So we'll start with um, the fact that we've heard a lot about how regular actors can pose broader geopolitical risks. I wonder if you, any of you who would like to step up, um, could speak to the ways in which state actors might also use tactics of irregular warfare and how they use, uh, for example, social media to spread misinformation to influence political campaigns, uh, change our understanding of the scope of conflict itself. So, yes, please. So, I'll start. In, in fact, it's what I was referring to a little while ago. But China is, has been using irregular warfare really for the last 20 years, and they've really gotten great about it. Um, and, and they, of course, are the state actor, um, which will be our competitor in peer to peer conflict. Um, but everything from TikTok, where they have accumulated vast amounts of information on Americans. Um, I talked to you a little bit about setting the lawfare narrative. Uh, but we don't talk about it here, but if you go to any other country, um, and I spend a lot of time abroad, every single one of them has heard the Chinese come to them and say, hey, by the way, we have a legal right to what we're doing in the South China Sea. Something um, that escaped me earlier today, and building these islands and our territorial claims of what we're doing in Vietnam and the Philippines. So there's this they, they're incredibly good at setting the narrative. Uh, they're really great about calling into question U.S. commitment to, to Taiwan. Uh, they do this at universities uh, where they directly uh, target uh, pro-Taiwanese or Taiwanese, uh, Taiwan students' organizations. Uh, they've gone through uh, economic organizations, the WTO, where they lose quite a bit. So between social media, TikTok, perfect example, uh, all the others as well, through setting the narrative, narrative and international organizations, the UN and others, <clears throat> the whole pushback on the Uyghurs, the Falun Gong uh, organizations, that's all part of their trying to set this idea that China is friendly to its minorities, yada, yada, yada. They are the masters. Russia on the whole Ukraine, how many of you know <clears throat> why Putin was found, um, uh, or, or there's a, a warrant after him by the ICC. One person, two people, maybe three, um, four, should be every single one of you. What do you think it is? Anybody? Is it because of the war in Ukraine specifically or something related to it? The reason is because of trafficking of children. Um, but we really don't hear about it here in the States, the incredible amount of stolen children out of Ukraine. Uh, why? Because we're so busy uh, listening to the Russian narrative about how they're protecting Russian speaking citizens or how Ukraine um, was really their territory to begin with or how if there was just a referendum, all the Russian speaking and the ethnic Russians would actually vote for them and how they only want a little piece. So those are two incredibly important state actors. They're also using proxy groups. The Chinese have this little uh, flotilla of supposed fishermen who are actually serving as uh, interdiction and, and antagonistic units um, in the South China Sea and other contested areas. So those are two really solid examples. Uh, sure, Mr. So, um, so if you want to define uh, information operations as a regular warfare, then everybody is using that. Everyone nowadays is dealing with information, disinformation, and misinformation, domestically and internationally. Uh, a state using irregular warfare, I think China's Belt and Road Initiative is irregular warfare. It's the example. 
They are uh, uh, <coughs> about the world, providing economic incentives to uh, other nations uh, to help and assist them. But their help and assistance is, well, we're going to come in here and build you a port because you need a port. 50% of that port only we can use, and you can't touch it, but you'll have 50% of a port that you'll be able to use. Uh, I think the Wagner Group is another example of regular warfare. While they may be uh, at a tactical level uh, involved in, in, in warfare and in, in a hot shooting match, if you will, with the violent troops organizations in Africa, uh, that's where Wagner Group actually started, uh, really made their name before Ukraine. Um, they are there under the auspices of helping out those nations with the violent uh, challenges. Uh, but what they're also doing is they're stealing all of their natural resources. Uh, they're going into different areas uh, within, a lot of, with a, within a lot of African countries, uh, not based on so much where the BEOs are, but based on where the gold mines are, and where the cobalt mines are. And all that money makes its back, its way back, or it's the portion that makes its way back to uh, the Russian leadership. So there's just a couple of examples of how states are using the regular warfare. So yeah, uh, all both great examples of my responses, I think, are also primarily focused on Russia, the People's Republic of China. Starting with Russia, I know that there has been some incredibly, uh, I'll say, impassioned debates as to the level of control that the Russian Federation, the Kremlin specifically, exercises over some of these transnational criminal organizations that seem to be operating at the behest of so, you know, is it at the direction of, or is it in service of the Kremlin? Uh, the Internet Research Institute was a perfect example based out of St. Petersburg, providing specific examples. Uh, this, amongst other hacking organizations or influence operations that the uh, Kremlin either directly supports through funding or through cutouts involving various oligarchs uh, to either influence overseas uh, uh, opinions on Russia and its activities, or attack critical infrastructure through cyber attacks. Uh, we've certainly seen an uptick in that here just uh, since the escalation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. What oftentimes gets lost in this conversation, and I think to my best previous point, is that Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 when they annexed the Crimea Peninsula. They backed their little green man, the uh, separatist, separatist, I'm using air quotes intentionally, separatist forces uh, in uh, the Donbass, but the Russians through their information operations were able to keep that kind of on the back burner as far as public or international attention. Then of course, when they come across the border out of Belarus and roll on key with a bunch of tanks, the cat was out of the bag. So everyone thinks of February 22 as being like the start of the invasion, but this has been going on for eight years previously. Um, and then since the the escalation of that war. We have seen hacking groups based in Russia, based elsewhere, that for all intents and purposes from an outside observer looking in, look like a transnational criminal organization, but are really conducting activities on behalf of the Kremlin. Uh, the other example, specifically looking at Russia, uh, the Night Wolves Motorcycle Club. This is the one that's been talked about. It was actually talked about even more before the escalation of the war in Ukraine. Uh, this is a, it originally started in Moscow. It has over 45 international chapters, uh, conducts influence operations, and in many, in many cases, suspected criminal activity in the Baltics, uh, Moldova most recently, there was some uh, night wolves activity that was particularly concerning. Again, what is the level of direction that the Kremlin has over the night wolves motorcycle club? That, that's up for debate, but what's not for debate is Vladimir Putin rides with them. They show up at all of his rallies. They certainly seem, if not beholden to, certainly incredibly friendly to the regime. Uh, I, I think you hit on very key points. You talk about irregular warfare, right? Talk about irregular. So when you think about uh, the private military organizations like Wagner Group, you think about all of the, the oligarchs and, 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 the, and the crime networks and the motorcycle gangs. If you think about the money laundering done by uh, Chinese uh, expats around, around the world, that nation state isn't providing direct oversight. They're not providing specific tasks and purposes for them to accomplish. They had to have a tacit, here's your left and right limits. Probably spoke about it indirectly, and as long as you're out there doing 
doing that stuff that, that benefits me, I'm not going to get in your way. That's what's irregular about all that. Yeah. And then, yeah, real quickly, just switching over to the People's Republic of, Con uh, People's Republic of China. Um, yeah, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, one thing that I, I think is important to note when you start talking about how China is competing in the regular warfare space is the debt trap diplomacy that's connected on the backside. Uh, so, for instance, China goes into a country, says, we'll build you a port. We get to only, like, 50% of it's only ours, and we can do whatever the heck we want in it. And, but you get to use the other half for free. Well, not necessarily for free. There's usually financing involved, right? At incredibly terrible rates. And at that point, then, the government of said country becomes in this debt trap diplomacy. They're, they're then increasingly beholden to Beijing from that point forward. Um, and we've seen it in <laughs> places. Uh, Africa, Central Asia, countries that then find themselves increasingly beholden at the direction of Beijing. And back to, again, the definition of regular warfare we're working with, it's about that influence over the relevant populations. We, in the United States, and I think most of the free countries in the, in the world, like to think that our influence is garnered through uh, the, the values that we espouse, the things that we, we say that we stand for. And I would argue that that is actually generally often the case. When you look at the trend across globe, I think more people, more countries want to be like the United States than like People's Republic of China or Russia. That said, absent that what I would call positive influence, countries like the PRC and Russia that find more coercive forms of diplomacy, like debt trap diplomacy. And the last bit I was going to say on the People's Republic of China, I know we talked about the, the Chinese maritime militia, certainly a challenge. One of the things, one of the issues that we've been seeing crop up increasingly and where we have been Making some gains in working with our partners and allies is the uh, unregulated and illegal fishing fleet. So in addition to the maritime militia, which is out there, there's certainly questions about who they answer to within the Chinese chain of command. And there's the unregulated and illegal fishing fleet, which really has no official tie. Uh, but we know for a fact, generally speaking, based out of China, uh, they go all around the world and they fish in other countries' territorial waters, which has multiple negative effects. One, it's money that goes back to People's Republic of China, enabling them to do other line activities. But then it also takes money away, and resources away from those countries that, in many cases, are partners and allies in the United States. So then they are less capable of resisting those line activities, and less capable of contributing to global security uh, through our partner operations. Thank you. So in the interest of time, I'm going to consolidate these five questions into two, and I'm sorry you're going to have to choose your own adventure on this one. Um, so one is about, the, uh, it's about America and America's role in IW and thinking about how we can and cannot engage in these practices or how we ought to, ought to, ought to engage in these practices. And the other one looks more at illicit financing streams and counter narcotics. So the first sort of clump of questions is, um, so is there a way that U.S. can combat irregular warfare without engaging in similar tactics? Um, or are these actually necessary to sort of engage warfare? Uh, and then is, are we actually at a disadvantage because we are a democracy um, in terms of thinking of the way that IW uh, implicates deniable covert and sometimes controversial interventions? So that's the, the U.S. side of things. Um, thinking about illicit financing streams that we also as well. Um, so thinking about counter narcotics in particular, <coughs> some of the IW challenges um, that we discussed bear on future U.S. counter narcotics policies, and I'll sort of tag on to there as an addendum um, that the how the way in which the state stability or relative stability of Mexico might factor into this discussion on counter narcotics um, doesn't feature prominently in the NSS or NDS. Why? Um, and then also another um, online that has been asked about non-state actors' use of natural resources. So maybe um, connecting that as illicit financing streams and how U.S. policy might be able to address those kinds of financing streams. So, for example, for the loss of those. So, um, take one. And go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to stick with the easier one, I suppose, in some respects. I'm going to stick with the U.S., uh, whether we're disadvantaged and how we might co collectively combat. Absolutely, we're disadvantaged. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not the bad guys, and that's incredibly important, and it needs to stay that way. Um, we are a, a republic that has 
um, some long-term principles and we need to stick with them. Um, we, we try to do the right thing, believe it or not, even though we come out badly sometimes. We don't bully other countries in, in the manner that others uh, might find appropriate. We, we try to act and embrace programs, policies, and doctrine that embody and reflect our principles as a republic, as a nation that believes in free speech, that believes in uh, rights, um, is might, and we have shared values um, with our partners. Um, unequivocally, if we lose that, we lose everything, in my mind. Um, that said, we've also become risk averse. And we do have, uh, by and large, I think actually our regulatory regimes, our laws, our statutes are on the right track. We, they got us through World War I, II, um, and the Cold War. Um, and they're probably right-minded. They need to be updated. We need to modernize our thinking. We need to use Title 50, for example, um, much more rigorously. We need to expand our concepts on Title 10. That's your defense concepts. Those are your regulations in the Defense Department. Uh, we need to modernize uh, what we're willing and able for intelligence organizations to do and get back out there and take a much more aggressive stance. Um, we have become too bureaucratic. We need to modernize our institutions, but I think um, we are disadvantaged and I'm proud of it um, because we are not ruthless and unprincipled, um, but we need to be more aggressive. I'm going to answer the same question or go after that same question. I'm choosing that adventure. So, um, and I agree with everything that Mary Beth has said, uh, having also worked in the space for some period of time. I think I would agree that we as a Democratic Republic uh, certainly have the severe disadvantage when it comes to competing against Russia and China, both authoritarian regimes, or the one essentially like China is a one party system. Russia, for all intents and purposes, is a one party system where the Kremlin and Beijing basically can do whatever they want, and the people have zero oversight or transparency to what they're doing, nor would they really be able to, to, to voice any opposition if that were the case. Um, I think that kind of building off of what Mary Beth started off with, I think that empowering and overseeing sensitive regular warfare activities is certainly something that we could do to compete better in this space. One of the challenges that I've spent a lot of time thinking on it. I know Mary Beth and, and the dads you have as well as that, that uh, dichotomy between Title 10 and Title 50 activities, uh, where those authorities provide some more leeway on, say, the Title 50 side versus the more constrained activities on the Title 10 side. Um, you know, I've always pushed for my various roles within the Department of Defense that the Department of Defense should seek to expand those Title 10 authorities as wide as possible. They should seek to leverage the Title 50 authorities to the greatest extent possible. Uh, we've seen certain efforts over the recent years. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about those in, in my next point, but you know, that has to also then be partnered with an incredibly robust and persistent oversight process. Um, everyone at this table has engaged in the oversight process. Congress, through the uh, intelligence committees, the armed services committees, exercise already, I'd say, fairly robust oversight. But as we continue to broaden authorities, operate in different spaces, this gray zone of irregular warfare, it's imperative that the Department of Defense work incredibly closely with the relevant committees on Congress to ensure that we are being as proactive as possible to give them the information, those that have the, the need to know the information that they need to ensure that the interests of the American people are being respected through that process. The American people elect these representatives and senators who then are trusted to do that oversight of the Department of Defense. Uh, I think that strengthening of partners and allies is certainly one place in which the United States can more robustly engage in the regular warfare space. Uh, for those who follow the regular warfare, uh, Special Operations Command Europe and, and the European Command, the Bat Command, put out the resistance operating concept a few years ago. Uh, this talked about how do we empower our partners and allies by building resiliency into their society so they can resist line activities by Russia, China, and others. Um, that's something that we saw applied incredibly successfully in uh, Ukraine. We've seen it in the Baltics. Uh, many of those lessons are being imparted to Taiwan. Uh, so 
you, that is one way in which you can engage in, a, in an irregular warfare in a way that preempts or deters aggression. Uh, we, tar we start to look at some of our existing authorities, Section 1202, Special Operations Forces Support to Irregular Warfare. As much as I want to make the whole Department of Defense engage in regular warfare, that is a specifically nuanced space where we use programs to enable partners and allies uh, and some of our other more sensitive irregular warfare activities that, again, are incredibly well overseen by Congress. So certainly, I, I, since that was first passed into law, I believe in the NDAA for fiscal year 17, I've been pushing that we need to build more concepts for that, we need to get more money from Congress for that each and every year. And back to my earlier point about the, the aircraft carrier of the Department of Defense sometimes moves, turns very, very slowly, but I think we're starting to get there on that program. And then there's some of the more persistent programs, the state partnership program, uh, by which the various national guards from each of the states and territories in the United States have persistent engagement with foreign partners and allies. That's certainly a program that we've looked at contributing to the resistance operating concept, uh, certainly laying some of the groundwork to be supportive of our broader regular warfare efforts. And finally, I think somewhere where we as the United States government have been disadvantaged for some time is controlling that global narrative. Um, at the Department of State, we have the Global Engagement Center, which has traditionally, over the last several years, been responsible for a lot of that uh, narrative engagement in that space. Um, it's, it has struggled with, uh, I would say, a level of confidence. Uh, back to my previous point, the United States is an amazing country. Uh, we represent a rich, proud history of democratic republicanism, and that's a story that we don't, we don't need to lie about. It. There's no, in that information operation space, we can tell the truth in such a way that it makes us more attractive and our message more attractive than our adversaries. Which adventure will you choose? Well, I, it's tough. I got lots of thoughts on on, on, on both, uh, and, and I'm happy to share them some other time. But I guess I'll take the last, the, the second part that Helen hit on, which was about the uh, uh, the financing, especially when it comes to to the current narcotics, and I guess resources in general. So, um, international crime exists to make money, right? If it, if, if it wasn't making money, they have no reason to exist, right? You might have some actors out there that are motivated by fame, but their fame is based on all the money they make. Doing this, right? By, by moving illicit materials. And it's mostly go to it's not only drugs, right? It's trafficking in humans. It's moving guns. It's moving, it's actually moving money. It's uh, moving uh, uh, wildlife. Um, and so one of our best tools, I believe, is to Hit them where it hurts and get after their, their finances. And, and while they launder money uh, through criminal activities, um, eventually that funding has to end up someplace in a regulated institution. So, actually, the Department of Defense does a lot of work through its counter finance program to help put together cases, for a better term, cases for the Department of Treasury to conduct sanctions. To kind of conduct seizures, uh, uh, to revoke visas, and all those things put together really hits my hurts. It, it, it takes away the money, it takes away the freedom of movement, um, and um, it really forces them to change the way they're doing business in order to try and, to, to try and get around that. So we've done uh, a very good job doing that in the, in the uh, transnational criminal organization uh, arena, but we've also done a fantastic job using those exact same tools against all the oligarchs um, from Russia uh, after the Ukraine war uh, started in order to punish the regime for what it was doing. Thank you all so much, and thank you all for coming today. In closing today's event, I'd obviously like to thank our, extraordinarily, our extraordinary panelists for taking the time to join us and sharing their unique and valuable perspectives. So just a reminder that this session has been recorded and will be released on the IWI website and social media. IWI aims to bring together the irregular warfare community to talk about important contemporary issues by generating the Irregular Warfare podcast, which releases every two weeks, written articles by members of the community, a fellows program, and of course, events like this one. If you haven't already, please do sign up for the monthly newsletter and it will be summarizing this content as well. And additionally, please sign up for the Trust After Betrayal newsletter at trustafterbetrayal.org, where we release original research on armed conflict and its aftermath each month. 
Thank you to all of you, our attendees, for taking time to attend or watch online. Uh, your attendance and feedback help to drive the content that we produce in the community, so I invite you to engage further with us following. Thank you so much.